Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Lomelli. I'm the Outreach and Government Affairs Fellow at Public Knowledge, and uh, really excited to uh, be here today. We have a very eclectic panel today, and I couldn't be more excited that the companies you see here represented really run the gamut um, in terms of scale and uh, focus within this broader emerging industry. Um, the first panel, which is entitled Meet the Makers, is really just an opportunity to kind of get our feet wet in terms of understanding these technologies. Um, we're going to be hearing uh, some of the stories of how these companies got started, and uh, we're just going to have an opportunity to just kind of talk about the stuff that they're specializing on. Um, uh, joining us in this panel will be Kathy Lewis, the Vice President of Global Marketing for 3D Systems. Dave Burns, the President and COO of X1. Hod Lipson, the co-founder of Fab at Home. Bray Pettis, the co-founder of MakerBot. Rick Pollock, the founder of Maker Gear, And Robert Schallenberg, the CTO of Shapeways. Uh, for those of you with uh, online capability uh, with uh, your devices, we will be uh, taking questions. We can take some questions via Twitter at the hashtag 3DDC, all one word. So feel free, as the panel's going on, to uh, share your thoughts and questions, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, get some of those in toward the end. Uh, so without any further ado, we'd love to give each of the panelists just a few minutes to talk about some of the stuff that they're working on at their companies, and uh, we'll begin with Kathy. Good afternoon. Can I just speak in Good afternoon. It's uh, my pleasure to be here with you, Kathy Lewis, 3D Systems, Head of Global Marketing. And this is a really interesting occasion for me because as you sit here to learn about 3D printing, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, just a month ago. 3D Systems is the founding technology and the founding company behind 3D printing. At the time, we called it rapid prototyping because we were creating a new mechanism where engineers and designers and architects, etc., could get their products to market faster. So we revolutionized product development. And that's where it all started. What we found is that each company that embraced it saw it as a unique competitive advantage. It allowed them to do something that no one else, they thought, in their industry was doing. So the storytelling didn't start back 25 years ago. They held it very close to the vest. Everything was confidential. So people like you and me at the time did not learn about 3D printing. It was all kept behind doors under secrecy and confidentiality. It really was in the last maybe 10 years that people started to talk about the benefits of the applications. And that's also the time frame when it moved from rapid prototyping to a new opportunity called rapid manufacturing. This is high value but low volume production printing using 3D technology. And that's when it really gets interesting, is now you can start to really change the way you not only do your product development, but in some cases, for the right reasons, the way you deliver your products to market. So just a couple of real interesting scenarios. Uh, a major helicopter manufacturer and the Department of Defense use opportunity to reduce supply chain, reduce weight, and produce the same part with the same characteristics at a lower cost on demand that go up in fighter jets and helicopters. Completely changed the way they thought about that. In the hearing aid industry, people didn't want to wait, wear the hearing aids because they were very uncomfortable. They were off the shelf. They were not made for you. Now we scan them, completely revolutionize the industry. You get your own personal hearing aid. Dental. You used to have to wear metal in your mouth to straighten your teeth. There's something called aligners. We produce something like 60,000 of those a day to help people straighten their teeth, and that's the tip of the iceberg. So the future is quite bright for where these technologies can take us. 3D Systems has really enjoyed a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity. We did an IPO almost immediately. 25 years ago, the promise was extensive, but we're now a $160 million company. So that's how long it's taken to get here. And part of that has been the confidentiality, part of it has been the frivolous lawsuits to stop the kind of technology, which is why I'm thrilled to be here. But leaving that behind, this next dawn, this next 25 years, is going to be about putting this in the hands of everyone. 
And that's why we're even more excited. So we've got rapid prototyping, we've got rapid manufacturing, and now you've got personal 3D printing that is on the cusp of allowing each and every one of you, even me, to be a maker if that's something we desire to do. From $1,300 a day to a million dollars. That's the broad range of this technology. But the applications are almost endless. And we're seeing organ donors as an opportunity. We're seeing bone creation as an opportunity. <coughs> It goes far beyond the home opportunity. That's certainly significant, but these technologies will inform the medical markets in a very unique way over the next several years. So I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be part of 3D Systems, and happy to take any questions at the right time to help share the knowledge we have around 3D printing. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I'm David Burns. I'm the president of um, the X1 company. I'm just wait a second, I'm going to build a digital scanner here on my iPhone. <laughs> what was the name of that site I had to go to? Uh, I don't know what the name of it. Trimensional. Oh, okay. Yes. I've got it right here. Scanner. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. Um, the X1 company is headquartered in Irwin, Pennsylvania, and we're just east of Pittsburgh. And I thought about what I was going to say today, so I think I'll probably start with a story. Um, many, many years ago, when I was coming out of college, I joined a traditional manufacturing technology company in Rochester, New York. And it was a relatively small company at that time, and I worked there for 27 years. And we grew from about 50 million in revenue in the time I was there, and I was running the company when I left. We were about $450 <coughs> in revenue. Along the way, I learned a lot about manufacturing. And there was one dirty little secret that I learned along the way that I thought I would go to my grave, and that was that in spite of all the efforts for optimization and lean manufacturing and Kaizen and Six Sigma and all the things we were trying to do, the fundamental premise behind the way we made stuff was never going to allow us to optimize manufacturing the way we needed to. I left there in 2004 and I actually wasn't going to stay in the manufacturing technology world and not long thereafter I met a guy who started talking to me about additive manufacturing. And for me it was sort of like the light went on. Um, I thought to myself, all these years I've been thinking about optimization, the answer is here. In this nation and emerging technology that we call additive manufacturing or three-dimensional printing or any one of a bunch of other names people use, the holy grail is actually there to get to the point where you can make precisely what you want, configure the way you want, when you want it, in the quantity you want it. Uh, if you want to make a hundred different ones all customized, you can make them that way. If you want a hundred the same, you can make them that way. And so in March of 2005, we started the X1 company uh, down in Irwin. Um, we immediately decided that we needed to be a global company. So today we have operations in Japan and in Germany. Uh, we have operations uh, in the US, Houston, Detroit, Seattle, and of course in Pittsburgh. And we've now grown to about $25 million in revenue um, with less than 150 people worldwide. Our fundamental approach, uh, we are far more interested in the technology basis than we are, in a sense, in the outputs that people use our technology for. Somebody's got to focus on the core sort of backroom technologies, and that's what we do. Uh, we are a licensee of MIT. You may know that uh, there are various approaches to additive manufacturing. Most of them start with a layer of material that somehow has to be bound in some fashion, then another layer added to it. Uh, the MIT approach is to put down layers of material and use uh, chemical binders that go through a printhead that's just like a printhead you use on a laser printer for a computer. And you spray binder into materials and you build things layer by layer. The conclusion we drew early on, by the way, we work in, in primarily in metals and ceramics. Um, so there's other people working lots of other materials, but those are our focal points. We made the decision early on, as I said, to globalize. We made the decision early on that we were going to focus largely on industrial applications. So in today's world of 3D printing, if you look at the different platforms that are available, X1 probably builds the largest platforms and, in some sense, the fastest platforms for printing because we're largely focused on industrial applications and not necessarily consumer one-off applications. So if you were looking at one of our machines, we're building build boxes that are the size of two-thirds of this table, and we're doing that in eight to ten hours. Um, you know, you may recognize some of our customers, BMW, Ford, 
Mercedes, Toyota, uh, than a whole lot of other customers that you probably wouldn't know their names. Um, but we're fundamentally focused on metals, on ceramics. Uh, we're, fun we're fundamentally focused on industrial applications. And the real reason I came today, and Michael and I talked at great length about coming or not coming, is because uh, we've grown now to be a significant company. We're proud of what we've done, and about 85% of our sales this year will take place outside of North America. Uh, we have relatively little difficulty selling outside of this country, and we have great difficulty selling inside of this country, and I think there's a whole lot of reasons why that maybe are worth exploring. So thank you for having us here, and I do hope you'll swing down later because we've got a table downstairs where we're showing all kinds of cool stuff. So thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Todd Lipson. Uh, I'm at uh, Cornell University. It's, uh, Fab at Home is uh, not a company, it's an open source project for uh, making uh, 3D printers that are basically <laughs> open and hackable and can be used by uh, anybody. So, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, you know, we've been working uh, with uh, 3D printing and rapid prototyping for uh, <coughs> almost a decade uh, in, in various ways. and. Uh, with, with all kinds of, of great ideas of, of printing robots and making uh, complex uh, machines and so forth. But one of the things that we noticed very early on is that almost nobody knows about this technology. We, the engineers around us knew about it, but the top person on the street, uh, they've never heard about it. But the moment we, we told people about it, even just you know a couple of words, you know, you can transform an electronic object, a blueprint, into a physical object like a cup and drink water out of it, people immediately were blown away. It was clear that, that you know, something here is, is, isn't being communicated. It's such an amazing, fascinating technology that, that isn't getting out there. And uh, it reminded me and, and many other people of uh, basically computers in the 70s. I think at the 70s for maybe, computers were available maybe for two decades before that, uh, mainframes. Uh, and, uh, but most people didn't know about computers, what could be done with them, certainly not what they could do with them at home. And if you look back, and most historians pinpoint the mid-70s as a transition point where these machines became uh, a commodity that reached the home market. And uh, how did that transition happen from the big mainframes, the expensive machines, uh, narrow markets, to the widespread home computers? Probably it had to do with you know, many factors that had to do with price, with scale, uh, but a lot of it has to do with the availability of open, <coughs> hackable, do-it-yourself kits of computers that people could build at home and could start doing all kinds of things with. And that kind of broke the chicken and egg a vicious cycle because suddenly uh, there were lots of uh, uh, computers, people could buy programs, there were lots of uh, programs, so there was reason to buy computers and people started using them. So we were thinking, okay, how can we make that transition happen with 3D printing. It's obviously the same kind of universal technology that, will, that can potentially have the same kind of, uh, of uh, implications. And we decided to make this open source, truly open, everything, so the, the software, the hardware, the circuit boards, uh, everything completely open, uh, downloadable, and allow people to hack uh, this, uh, this uh, system. So we created the open source uh, uh, Fab at Home project. Uh, that was uh, more or less in parallel with, um, with the RepRap project, which is also an open source 3D printing project that came out of Bath University in UK. And uh, the, the reaction was immediate. I immediately saw lots of hackers and then people started downloading the blueprint, making uh, these printers. Lots of variations of these printers came about. And what's really interesting is you know, the whole variety of new materials being explored and so forth. So, uh, and, and what people uh, uh, do with this. One of the kind of unique uh, aspects of, of uh, this system is that it can work with a huge variety of materials uh, from cheese to uh, stainless steel. And we have uh, literally these two examples downstairs, uh, a shuttle printed out of cheese uh, and, uh, and a couple items printed out of stainless steel. So you can all with the same machine, same process. Uh, and it's just fascinating to see how having that machine in your hand unleashes creativity. I showed one of these machines in uh, my son's second grade classroom, and we printed a couple of items out of Play-Doh, and immediately the kids 
went crazy. One, one kid wanted to change the design, print another one. Another kid was calculating how many shovels he can print out of one block of Play-Doh and how much profit he could make and how small he could make them and so forth. It's really fascinating how whatever the inclination is, uh, how uh, children connected with it. Uh, other people are printing food with it, uh, printing chocolate and peanut butter. Uh, and it's just uh, uh, a couple of days ago I was uh, showing this printer at some place and I took it out of a cab and the cab driver stopped me and said, wait a minute, is that the machine that, uh, that prints um, celery? On, I saw it on CNN printing celery and my brother really needs one of these. So, so it's, it's, it's just amazing how people connect with it and immediately it sparks innovation in ways that, that you can't uh, imagine. So I think 3D printing uh, is really, I know in, in, at, at Cornell, it, uh, the, the machine is being designed by a bunch of students. It's a, it's a course, it's a product design course. The students come and go, they learn about product design, they improve it. It's not, I always tell them it's not about getting an a, a or a B or a C in the course. If you design it incorrectly, you're going to get a phone call in the middle of the night from somebody in Germany who is not happy about the product. It's a real product, it's not a, just a, a classroom project. Um, and uh, it's um, uh, the, the connections to all these different things uh, uh, is, uh, is is just amazing. The last thing I want to say, I think, is is that I think 3D printing is is a tip of the iceberg of a larger scale phenomenon, which is personal manufacturing. So part of the reason why we can make all these 3D printers at uh, you know low cost hackable systems is because other personal fabrication technologies are available, like laser cutting, uh, CNC milling, even um, uh, programmable knitting machines. All these different personal fabricators are beginning to, to, uh, to um, swamp the market, and there's, uh, they are unleashing creativity in many different ways. Lots of new businesses, lots of new business ideas. Uh, it's, it's not just 3D printing, and I think every, everything we've talked about here uh, today, you can take from 3D printing and apply uh, verbatim almost to any of these other uh, personal fabrication technologies. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Bree Pettis of MakerBot and Thingiverse, and uh, we make affordable 3D printers. And our goal is to democratize manufacturing and make it so that it's within the reach of everybody. So when you go to go think, when you want something, rather than immediately thinking, okay, where am I going to go buy that? You think, hmm, maybe I can make a buy. And interrupt the consumer process that way. And we have a great community uh, called Thingiverse. Uh, it's a universe of things. And it's a great place to share your digital designs. Just this last weekend, the community collaborated on making an actual physical working clock, like a grandfather clock mechanism. And they shared it. And it's uh, under an open license. So you can, if you have a 3D printer, you now can have a clock. Um, so, so you can know what time it is. Uh, and um, so we're at a really special time right here and now. I don't think. This is never, the, the people that are in the room right here, not just the people up here, but all of you in the audience, this is the first time we've gotten together for a meeting like this to really talk about 3D printing and personal manufacturing in one room. So for all of you who are here, you're gonna be like, in like 20 years when your kids are like, hey, you know, the 3D printer's broken, I can't, my skateboards, my skateboard, I can't go skateboarding today because it's not done. Um, you're going to be able to say, yeah, I was there back with all that crew, you know, kind of homebrew computing club style time. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and, you know, we're, at, you know, I just think back to when I was 10 and what it would have been like if I'd had a 3D printer and we'd be living in a different world today, for sure. <laughs> and so it really encourages me to get this technology out to the young people to the people, to, to, to really just brute force the innovative process to, and make it happen more and more and more with people in the world. Hi, I'm Rick Pollock. I founded Maker Gear way back in, I can't use it, my voice confuses me. <laughs> my brother's talking to me or something. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I found it about, I can use the voice. 
Um, I found a Maker Gear way back in 2009. And before I get into Maker Gear specifics, maybe a little history, but uh, you know, 20 years ago or so, something called, uh, what do they call it, desktop publishing, you know, came into existence. You know, prior to desktop publishing, you had a choice of using a typewriter, or you had a choice of using, you know, a commercial fabrication system, and there was a big, you know, chasm, you know, big gap in the middle. And then, you know, you got this WYSIWYG software, and you got these laser printers, and all of a sudden, you had the ability And I really had no idea, you know, how to go about doing that. So, you know, I tried to, uh, I worked on it for a while, I spent a bunch of money, you know, trying to figure out how to do it. Making a prototype was no problem, but actually taking a, a prototype and creating a finished product, you know, there was no, there was no clear path. It was a big chasm, and I didn't know how to span that. So, I didn't pursue that product, but what it did do is develop an interest in solving the root problem. How do you go from, you know, an idea to a prototype? to short run manufacturing, to a commercial product, and a nice, smooth, graceful arc. So, you know, a couple of years ago, I felt the time was right, and I started Maker Gear. And when I started Maker Gear, I didn't know what our product was gonna be. I simply knew that desktop public, I mean, desktop manufacturing, digital fabrication, whatever you wanna call it, time was right. And so now, you know, two years into it, we make 3D printer kits. We ship these things all over the world. As I sit here, we've got kits going to Australia, Taiwan, South America, Europe, I mean, this is really growing, and you know, we print these parts in house on these little 3D printers, and we use laser cutters, and so we have, we basically taken the technology, you know, this desktop manufacturing technology, and we use it in house, and we make kits for people that, so they can also use this technology. And uh, so, you know, this stuff is really disrupted, it's really exciting, and I guess that's why we're here today. Okay, my, uh, my name is uh, Robert Schoenberg, um, I'm from uh, Shapewise, and Shapewise is a personal fabrication service online. Um, not everybody is capable of wanting to have a desktop uh, 3D printer at home. They're still quite expensive, or they want certain materials which are not available. And what Shapewise does is make these uh, printers available for people to use as a one-off service. So they can create something on the desktop, they upload it to Shapewise, and they can order it, be printed for them, and we ship it. You could also, there's another option we also have available, is that you find something in our shop. If you don't have uh, 3D design, you can find some stuff that designers has made, <coughs> uh, which is, uh, an, 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 for instance, a piece of jewelry, or um, a, a certain uh, an iPod holder, or an, iPod, uh, an iPhone uh, case, and you can order it from Shapebase. You can also work together with existing designers on modifying existing products. So you can go online and find something that you like, but you want to modify it for a personal event, like a wedding, um, these kind of things. You go to Shapeways and then you find that you work with a designer and he makes the modifications for you, and uh, you order it and they will produce it for you. Um, basically, you can see Shapeways as a front-end for all these technologies which you already heard here. So we do XDR a customer from, uh, from X1 and use them with their metal printers uh, to produce metal objects, and mainly jewelry. Uh, we also use uh, 3D systems machines for uh, specific hobbyist items, um, especially um, the, the, in the model train business. People like to have these kind of small model train pieces which you can't buy anywhere else. People want a specific model which is not manufactured by one of the bigger manufacturers. Uh, we produce it for them. One-offs, and we can ship it all over the world. Um, what we try to do is make it affordable so that everybody can, can, yeah, uh, can, can pay for it. And at the same time, we try also try to make it very, very easy so that everybody can do it. Because, well, to be honest, 3D design is not that easy. It takes a while before you get, uh, before you are capable of doing it. And I'm very happy that these guys next to me are trying to make it happen that all the young kids are learning about 3D design, and, uh, and more and more kids can actually work with this technology. Because it is, in our vision, a very important technology, which indeed will be disruptive in how we see things. Um, Shapebase was founded in 2007. Um, we received uh, funding from an, uh, from an American investor back in 2010. We have moved our headquarters to New York, but we were actually founded in the Netherlands in Europe. So I'm, I'm, I'm recently living here in the US. And um, we have several production locations. Uh, we have actually two in the US and two in, in Europe. 
And the cool thing about the technology is that you can actually bring manufacturing back to close to where the consumers are. So you don't have to produce it anymore in China, but you bring it to the place where your consumers are. It saves in lead time, it saves in logistics costs, and obviously there is also an important uh, environmental factor involved here. So all this combined, it is, is a, it's a very great technology. And what you see with Shapeways is that we have now a little over 150,000 products online. And if you see what, what people are trying to create with it, you cannot really imagine what the, what the creativity of people is when you give them access to this technology. They make things like custom jewelry, home decoration items, all kinds of gadgets for iPhones, iPads, uh, Android phones. They make things like rocket nozzles for hobbyist rockets. They make uh, uh, parts for, for, for model trains. They make uh, things for, uh, for, model to, um, uh, for, for remote controlled helicopters. It's, it's, the, the limits are endless. And for one of, one of the things is when, when we started out with shapers, we really had no clue what people would make with it, just that it would be really, really useful. And one of the things that people start doing at some point is that they're making parts for record players. You know the big ones that we used in the past, the, the, the big black records. And I didn't know they even existed anymore, but people are making parts of record players with shapers because they want to make their own, own record players. And, and since they are not really available for, for consumers to buy off the shelf anymore, and there's still people out there who want to play those record players, they still are making them, but they're using sh things like shapers. And I think that's really awesome that, that we enable people to do whatever they want. Thank you. Why don't they come back? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Um, and for those of you that have just walked in, um, and for everybody else, I'd like to encourage you again, you can engage in the dialogue on Twitter on your devices at hashtag 3DDC, all one word. Now, uh, listening to everybody, I think one of the, uh, again, a great point is that there's this wide scope, everybody coming from a different background and, and a, you know, different history and how you got here. And within that scope, where do you see this industry in the future, um, whether it be, you know, as we were saying, you know, well, the past 10 years would be different. Uh, you know, where, where, you know, what capacities do you see this industry blooming? Um, and take that as you'd like it, you know, you see it in the next 10 years or uh, the next few years. Well, first off, we're talking a lot about the end user and the consumer taking advantage of the technology. I think one of the real keys to it is to get in the hands of the student. The next generation of designers and engineers has got to have the right tools. And all of us have seen tremendous ex exposure at the student level, losing funding for certain kinds of capabilities, these technologies can help them learn to build, they can learn to imagine, it brings home concepts like volume, etc. 3D printer is not just about engineering and design, it is really cross-curricular in its use. So we think there's two steps to this. I don't disagree with anyone on the panel that wants to totally democratize this, but if we do this right, we'll get it really three different ways. We'll get it in the hands of the students that are going to grow up and learn that these technologies are just part of their heritage part of their expectation, and it'll bring out their creativity. We'll see it go into the consumer space based on one really important missing element that some of you have touched on, and that's content. And I'm so glad to see content partners here today, too, with Autodesk represent. CAD software is expert software. That means I can't use it. Most of us in this room cannot do a CAD file. We need to have simple, easy to use, fun tools to help people create their objects. And it can be low-cost scanners, it can be gaming-like solutions that allow young people to get there. It can be a Kinect device that snaps a photograph and you print the 3D object from. But content has got to be king in this, just like in, it was in desktop publishing. So if we can do the content and have the affordable solutions, that will help the consumer. If we can get it into education, that will ensure that people know what to ask for when they grow up. And then if we can remember that at the high end, rapid manufacturing, could literally change the way we do products. It's not going to replace current technologies, but it will augment them, it will enhance them, and it will give us low volume, very high value manufacturing at the point of need, just in the nick of time. And those three together, I think, are extremely important. Well, I think it, what must be obvious to you is the, the term, this is an industry, I don't think applies. What we are is a collection of technologies that are going in a variety of directions, no more than, than computers are an industry. I mean, computers are a series of technologies that are linked and, and cause a lot of 
industries to be spawned. We come from totally different orientations here, and yet we're all thinking about the same set of technologies. And I want to pick up on a point that Kathy made, and that is that the technology chain is a set of preceding and sort of post technologies that, that start with, wow, well, I got an idea, and all the way down to, wow, well, I got an object. And there's a bunch of things that have to link and connect to make that happen. And really, in the last five years, there's been an explosion of development in all of those. But as I said before, um, our focus is largely on industrial applications. And if we're going to get serious about making um, metal parts that are useful from an industrial setting, um, we can get there. But there's going to have to be a significant amount of investment to get us there. The question is, who's going to make that investment? You know, is the U.S. willing to step up and make the investment or not? Are, are other uh, sophisticated and, uh, countries willing to make that investment? Yes, they are. They clearly are. So are we going to be part of that or aren't we? And I don't know the answer to that. I will tell you that we need investment dollars badly for development. And um, it's still possible. But that's why I'm hoping to hear the answer to the question is, are we going to step up and do that? Um, I think that, uh, you know, I tell my students that in, in uh, maybe 20 or 30, 40 years, uh, they'll have a hard time explaining to their grandchildren how they lived without a 3D printer in their home. How they actually had to order things and wait 24 hours until they were shipped overnight, as opposed to downloading them uh, uh, from the internet and printing them right on the spot. So I think really in terms of, uh, I don't know, about 10 years, but in a slightly longer term, this is, this is definitely going to be everywhere. Uh, and the question is, what's the path? And there, there are multiple paths uh, to get there. Some, uh, there's a lot of uh, issues that have to do with content. Uh, uh, as was mentioned, uh, we are at the point, I think, where we have amazing tools. We don't have as much content to print. What oh, Shapeways is doing, uh, Thingiverse, uh, these, uh, all these uh, sites, help a lot with, with creating this content. Uh, new uh, uh, CAD programs that are easy to use, just like word processors, went hand in hand with uh, laser printers to, to create the desktop publishing. That's also an important uh, uh, part of that. Uh, there's also somewhat of a, a missing language to describe some of these objects, and there, there is uh, an ongoing uh, effort now to standardize the way printers and CAD systems communicate in order to allow uh, 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 to allow uh, uh, the representation of complex multi-material uh, parts in ways that, that cannot be described using conventional technology right now. So there are a couple of uh, different uh, uh, technological uh, issues. Uh, and the, these are, I think, I think most of the technological is, issues are, are within reach. Uh, pricing, prices are going down. Uh, I think a lot of it also has to do with education and uh, getting this into the hands of students, but I think even earlier into, uh, into elementary classrooms. There's all these studies about uh, kids deciding or, or making up their mind about whether or not they're, they're good in math or engineering by fourth grade. So we need to, I think, bring these manufacturing tools to fourth grade and below. Really, the lower grades and allow kids to access and see things being made in front of their eyes and unleash their, 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 their creativity that's there just needs to be, to be, um, to be encouraged. So I think that's, uh, I, if I look 10 years from now, what I would like to see is a fabricator in every classroom. Just like we have a computer in every classroom, we should have a fabricator. It is a universal technology, and that's, that's how we um, should think about it. I think the question was how what's how, what's the worldwide takeover plan, basically, right? <laughs> so um, one of the cool things is that it's on. It's totally on. Uh, if you know, when we first started, we <laughs> joked that our customers were time traveling antique hunters from the future trying to get early models, and we're at the point now where we they just go out every day. They're, we've got four, you know forty two hundred and forty two machines in the wild right now, and. Those people are living in a pretty fantastic future. We had a user uh, on Thingiverse with a handle Finflood who uh, he was go he needed to propose to his sweetie because they were going to Iceland the next day. So we went to his local hackerspace and printed out a ring and gave it to her. And like it's you know she was the right person because the first thing she asked was like, "Wow, what is this made of? How did you do this?" 
<laughs> and, um, you know, there's sort of these absolutely normal things that can happen when you, that, well they're, well, they're totally fantastic, but they become absolutely normal when you have a 3D printer. We've got a guy in the audience, Marty, who moved into a new apartment and realized that although he could get a shower curtain at the local, like, store, he couldn't get shower curtain rings. So, rather than, he was faced with the real possibility of having to take a bath. And <laughs> instead, he realized, wait, I've got a maker bot. I live for these moments. And he made shower curtain rings and was the superhero. So, we're, you know, we're seeing this just blow up. And if you're not, in, if you're not on for the ride, you know, get a machine, start playing around with it. The actual, the CAD materials are actually getting better. It's nice, I, I see friends in the audience who are actually making the tools that are, that are coming out. Just in the past month, on the web, we've got something called WebGL, which allows you to do 3D, 3D stuff in your browser. So you can go to 3dtin.com and create something that's kind of like Lego, so like a three-year-old can do it. And then you can export, you can either save it to the desktop and send it to your 3D printer, or you can share it right from the browser to Thingiverse, where the world can see your objects and just click like. Um, and then we've got another one that just came out called Tinkercad. That guy's awesome, and he's, uh, he's made a more complex, kind of towards a more CAD type thing, but it's still super easy. It's in the browser. You just go to tinkercad.com and design something. You could, do, you could probably do it right now if you can get wireless. Um, but I guess my main thing is just like, it's on. Let's, it's going to be fun. How many of you have 3D printers? Yeah! Hold on. Oh my god. Hold those up. Hold those up. I went to the choir was here. <laughs> okay, that's all. Okay. For today, how many of you didn't know what a 3D printer was? Okay. Yes! <laughs> and one last question. How many of you guys have used a Fab Lab? Okay. Well, for those of you who are unfamiliar, or maybe unfamiliar with Fab Lab, basically what they are is they're application laboratories, they originally out of MIT, I guess, I don't really know the whole history. I just know they have really excellent technology inside. They have laser cutters, 3D printers, uh, milling machines, shop bots, and some, some strange twist of fate, we have three uh, Fab Labs in Cleveland, which we're based out of Cleveland, and a local Fab Lab. So a couple of years ago, question for? Oh, I just wanted to, I'm so happy you mentioned Fab Lab. I'm Phyllis Klein. I'm bringing Fab Lab to DC and right now MIT, hello pod, uh, has left me their mobile Fab Lab and it's going to be here through July. So if you go to fablabdc.org, please come visit. We have not only 3D printing technology, but all kinds of other processes that allow you to realize your ideas. Thank there you, you go. Okay, so um, so a couple years ago, my daughter was third grade class. I took a 3D printer in there, and they really liked it. And I told them in a few years they'd be printing their shoes, and they really, really liked that idea. And, uh, and just um, next week, I think it is, you know, the mobile fab lab is going to my other daughter's school, and so I'll be helping out there. These are fifth graders, unfortunately. Um, but you know, they're going to be you know using laser cutters primarily, and you know, so this is absolutely going into schools, you know, some of our customer universities and middle schools and so forth. So like Bree said, it is absolutely on. And you know, what's going to happen is this, this technology is going to continue to mature. And as it gets better and easier to use and more reliable, it's going to just find its way into, des into desktops and homes, just like laser printers. Maybe not to that extent, but you know, the same kind of thing. OK, uh, let me start with question two. Um, who ever flew, flew in a 777 Boeing airplane? Did you know there are 3D parts, 3D printed parts in an airplane used in production? The part of this airplane is produced with 3D printing. And what they do, they build the cable holders in, of, of the inside the plane uh, using technology called 3D printing. And uh, because the cables are different, the number of cables running each in each part of the plane, they need to be different everywhere. So it's actually Boeing is one of the biggest 3D printer companies out there and they're using it every day. Um, so we're talking about the future, but the future is already today, and uh, it, it's, it will only get bigger. Um, well, we already talked a lot about technology, but the reason is also a little bit why. Why are we? Why will we print printing big? And at Shapeways, we did some extensive research on that, and I would like to share that since the rest already talked about technology a bit. Um, we've seen, and in, 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 in the worldwide research, is that that young people, and I'm talking everybody on the third are really, really interested in personalization and customization of products. They no longer want to use mass-produced goods. 
they see a lot of added value in, in making the stuff their own. They feel that, uh, that things which they use every day are an extension of personality. And it's an enabler why 3D printing is, is will get big because 3D printing makes that possible. It makes it possible to make one off customized production for, for a reasonable price. Another reason is, is that there is something going on like the maker movement. Um, and the maker movement is that, that there is a, a real new grassroots thing that people want to make things themselves. So they build old cars, or let, uh, let me say the example of the, of the record player. Um, people are more and more interested in, in uh, yeah, not only buying off the shelf, but building actually the thing uh, themselves and customizing it to their own liking, making their own, own boards, making their own electronics. Um, and these two things will make uh, propel this, this technology, and especially having a printer at home, to the next level. Um, well, I think that that is, is one, of the, the, one of the key things that, that 3D printing will get very, very big. And that's also the reason why, why ShapeX uh, exists, uh, to allow and enable people to do that. So now that we know where we want to be, where uh, or how our takeover plot is going to unfurl, what are some of the barriers that you see in route to uh, in, in, in route to achieving what we're hoping to achieve? And along the same lines, what have been some uh, barriers you've encountered thus far? Are they one and the same? Manufacturing is hard. <laughs> you know, we it just is like getting getting things made. Is, getting things made is is very powerful, but you know, there's kind of a saying, there is a saying, hardware is hard, and we come up, yeah, you know, we just come up on issues where like, we go to buy more motors, and there just aren't any, and so then we have like, we have to, we have to make our customers are luckily patient enough to wait till we, till that we man get more manufactured. <laughs> so, um, so other obstacles would just be, uh, well, I don't really see them as obstacles, it's just a matter of like, I'm just impatient. When you can, when you, when you, you know, when it's not, I think part of it is uh, one of the obstacles that's coming up is just that, you know, I'll be on the subway with MakerBot on my lap, and people can, I mean, people will ask me like, hey, what's that? And I'll be like, I can easily just, just as easily say, 3D printer is teleporter, and get kind of a similar look. So I think one of our biggest challenges is just, is just worldwide awareness, and just a, a cultural awareness that, that this is, you know, like, like we said, that it's on. See, we don't have enough breeze. Yes. If Bree was everywhere, you would all know and have your own 3D printers already. So awareness is absolutely one of the big challenges. It has been for 25 years. But we do have an opportunity now with the products being more affordable, with the materials being a little bit better, with some new content tools coming out. So what are the remaining barriers? Okay, so if you take awareness out of the way, what are some of the things that are going to keep the industry from growing as fast as it can or maybe should? It's going to be around the materials. Do we have all the right materials for the applications? And who's going to develop them? And is there enough value in the development of those materials to get the right companies to make those development investments? 3D systems, as the largest player in the 3D printing industry, invest millions of dollars annually. We have 400 patents. We have six unique print engine technologies. And while it's a very fragmented market and there are a lot of players now, we're the biggest at $160 million. So why is it that we can't break out and grow a lot faster? Because we have to put money in the materials and the technology and now the content, and we have a service as well. We need to make sure that people understand the degrees of difficulty. Maybe there's some more investment, but there are fewer barriers. We have a lawsuit pending right now that's totally frivolous. It's brought by a $10 billion company, and we lose five cents of EPS every quarter to keep that lawsuit going. The German court threw it out, but it's still pending here in North America. And I'm not complaining about the system, but I'm saying if we allow those continued types of frivolous lawsuits, it will hurt the emerging part of the industry even more than it's hurt you know, an established 25-year-old player. So that's important. Now take it into your home. Are there going to be product liability issues that we have to think about? Uh, are there going to be other IP constraints? Getting those on the table now and thinking about them in advance might help us 
keep them from becoming barriers to the growth of the industry. I would hate to see Bree not be able to have as much fun as he's clearly having. <laughs> so those are some of the things that we think of that keep us up at night um, that I think could constrain the industry if we're not careful and thoughtful. And that's one of the reasons I'm thrilled that public knowledge is bringing this forum together. Because once you talk about something, you can start to fix it. But if you, if you haven't brought it in and you haven't put it on the table and started to think about it, it, it sneaks up on you later. And I'd hate to see that happen because it's been a long, grueling 25 years and we are on the cusp of great stuff, all of us. Kevin, would you be able to expand a little bit on that, on that case? Or? Well, um, let me just say that surround materials, but we've had technology cases as well. So if you're going to invest, you know, so we're 160 million, we invest 10, 12, 14 million dollars annually in R&D. We're just a little company, really, in the scheme of things, and you guys are even smaller, so my heart goes out to you. So people will bring a challenge against our patent portfolio, which is legitimate. It's got longevity. It's continued to be added to. We make those investments, and we have to respond. We have to fight them. We can't get them to go away. This latest one, this one that's extremely excruciating, is brought by a $10 million materials company. And they're saying that our patents, because we're in the material business as well, are infringing theirs. And again, the German courts have thrown it out. But it's still pending. They're deposing customers. I mean, it's really difficult when you're happy to go through this. And it keeps part of that investment that could go into technology from getting the technology, because it's going to legal costs. So again, this is just a, an opportunity for others to try to avoid these, because it can be crippling to a very small startup company. I some months ago, I read an article um, that was entitled Digital Natives and Digital Immigrants. I don't remember where I read it, it was in some journal. And the premise of the article is that the biggest divide that exists in society today is no longer um, gender or racial or you can list a bunch of stuff. It's between people who were born into the digital age and those that weren't. And the premise of the article is that the people in society who hold power are primarily digital immigrants, like me, I'm 57 years old, okay, I don't get it lots of the time. Um, people who have power are digital immigrants, people who have ideas are digital natives, and they don't understand each other very well. So one of the solutions to this problem is time, because slowly but surely, people who were born into the digital age are emerging into positions where they have authority, becoming managers and directors, and are taking over operations where 10 years ago they may have been junior in some fashion, and we even see that happening gradually, and it's, and it's enlightening. But, but that gap to me is the big one. Because people who have the power to make decisions, make policy, create funding, to a large extent, don't get this. And until they do, we're going to have trouble growing. Um, when they do, it's going to get a whole lot easier. President Company excluded that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this is really an obstacle, but you know, one of the things that I've observed is that when we sell cake, and you know, people have to put these kids together to have their printer. Um, you know, some people want a kit that's hard. They want something that's complicated to put together because they want to learn something in the process. They're as interested in the printer as they are in printing. They want to learn about the electronics. They want to learn about the program. They want to learn about the mechanicals. And other people simply want a kit that's easy to put together because they just want to print. So you've kind of got these parallel paths. Do we make it easy or do we make it hard? You know, I kind of want to make it hard because you know that's where you know you learn something. But you know if people want something easy, you know you got to give them. You know I guess you have to give them something easy. So it's not and that's, that's a, not necessarily an obstacle, but there is these two kind of distinctive areas where you've got some people who just want printers or devices that work, and other people who really want to get into technology and learn. From it. There's uh, I think there's a couple of uh, I wouldn't say barriers, but you know challenges and things that need to be done. Uh, and uh, it, it is, I, I was talking about this recently uh, uh, at a conference, and uh, I was keeping you know, the analogy to the computer period uh, keeps coming up. And somebody told me that back in the 70s, there were uh, 8,000 companies making micro uh, computers, very small kits, trying to sell them. Um, most of them we don't know about today. Uh, maybe we know, uh, you know, we know of a few software companies that came out uh, at that time. But uh, what, what happened was this, there were lots and lots of companies, uh, there were lots of different operating systems, there was uh, a, a huge, uh, uh, there wasn't a lot of standardization in, in, the, in the way computers were made and in software and compilers and all these things. 
At some point, uh, standards came along, and once the standards uh, kind of solidified, things began to take off. It was easy to to uh, to connect. You know, different systems could talk to each other, could connect, and so forth. So I think one of the challenges, and maybe just a matter of time, we at I feel we are at this point now where there is another three D printing company every other day. I keep reading about them. Uh, new printers, new ideas, new materials, new new printing technologies. Uh, it's a little bit of the wild west, and that's 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 good for growth. Uh, in the beginning, but at some point, I think there's going to be some consolidation, some standards need to come along, uh, and uh, that will help uh, things uh, grow. And of course, we have to find a way to make standards that help growth, but not uh, somehow uh, damp uh, innovation, uh, stifle innovation. So finding that balance is going to be tricky, but I think that that's, uh, that's one of the challenges that need to be addressed. Applications for the right applications, for the right solutions, and in most cases, we're taking, you know, um, Mr. Shapeway's down here. I forgot your first name. Is it Robert? Robert, yeah. Thank you. I didn't really forget, because I'm older than you are. <laughs> but at any rate, we, um, we've been working with these very complex assembly, uh, assemblies that go into airplanes, things that fly, because that's one of the big problems that they have. It's the supply chain. It's the cost of the tooling. All of those things come into consideration when you're building an aircraft, for instance. Well, we can take that. 15, 20 piece assembly, and we can redesign it with great software and get it down to a single piece. All the twists, turns, etc. that's the beauty of additive manufacturing. So now you can produce that piece. Supply chain, be darned, it's gone now. You've got one piece, it's off the shelf in an electronic file, and somebody simply sends us an email and says, print that now. The characteristics are such that for that air baffle, air duct, whatever, non-structural, mostly today, you're going to reduce the price, you're going to reduce the supply chain, you're going to have a better part, it's going to have the same characteristics, and it is now on demand, which is unheard of in manufacturing. No tooling, your waste has gone down dramatically. These are essentially green technologies. So while I don't think it's the materials costs that are, that are preventing the broader adoption, I think there's an education opportunity, and that's up to companies like myself and my partner here and you, Kevin, at the FBI, I know you use these technologies for a very long time. Don't worry, everybody, he's not uh, working today. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> yes. but at the end of the day, I think it's going to be choices in materials, it's going to be education, and it's going to be continuing the innovation with the machines that do the additive manufacturing. Because I will not tell you that every application works in additive manufacturing today. It's application by application, and it's companies with the knowledge that have to help you make the right decision but we're seeing more and more, particularly in aerospace and defense, surveillance, et cetera, unmanned vehicle, you name it, there's some great stuff. And now some of the major automotive companies are starting to produce a lot of their test cars and things using additive manufacturing and certainly artistically that the applications are all harmless. Well, I think specifically, it's not a question of materials, it's a question of scope and scale. If you walk into an automotive plant today, you'll see hundreds of millions of dollars in investment to produce hundreds of thousands of things the same way. And if I walk in tomorrow and say, I've got a way, better way of making one part, they'll say, great. they say, what is it going to cost you to make 100,000 of those a week? Um, well, it costs you X millions in investment. Well, why should I displace my already in place $100 million investment with another $50 million investment? What do I get out of that scope and scale? But over time, as people begin to think about questions of lean manufacturing and all these things, um, and those investments age, there's an appropriate and normal time where I think transitions take place. And we're sort of on the cusp of that. Uh, 2011 has is a, is a, is been a good year for investment in this end of the business because people went a couple of years without much of capital investment. And they're looking now saying, okay, I've got some old machines, I've got to replace them, how am I going to replace them? Wow, this is something that really works. Um, so, I, but I don't think it's a question of materials. Uh, it is a question, though, of scope and scale from, from where I sit. Um, I think Kathy's got something where she says like the airplane the airplane parts you're making should be made out of the appropriate materials and, and yes. I do that like Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but you know, on, on the sort of um, uh, in, in to get it out to people so that they feel comfortable innovating, the materials have to be cheap. So yep. that you can yep. so that you can make as many mistakes as it takes yep. to be able to get your innovation out there. Um, you know, ABS a lot of it, a lot of that fabrication stuff uses ABS, and it's just the same thing Legos made out of this commodity. It's, it's 
really cheap. Uh, I gotta give a shout out to the RepRap community. They basically got obsessed with uh, a, a material called PLA, and at least they're the ones who made me aware of it, which is polylactic acid made from corn, and it smells like waffles when you print with it, and it's just beautiful. Um, that's a fun thing to print with, and it's really cheap too, and it's biodegradable, which is a bonus. So I think, uh, it sounds like there's more questions, so let's just move, carry on. I just want to say that uh, one more thing, uh, it's not just about the cost of materials, it's about the range of materials. Uh, and the ability to innovate with materials, so the ability of people to try out new materials and not depend on a unique supplier that, that dictates what materials they can work with. And finally, I think the most important thing is the ability to print with multiple materials at the same time. So this is a little bit like moving from monochrome to color, or for, but more than that, if you can print with 15 materials at the same time, you can put wires and, and, and rubber and, and, and uh, hard material and soft and metal and polymers at the same time, the, the, the range of things that you can make on a single machine is going to be incredible and will make the current technology of today like uh, you know, a dot matrix printer uh, is for, for all of us now. So, so I think it's, materials is really where is very, very important, but it's not just the cost, it's the range and the ability to print multiple materials together. And uh, if you could please uh, just introduce yourself with your name and if you're with any particular organization or company. Okay, Elliot Maxwell, Johns Hopkins. I'm just curious, on the panel there are both people who are using proprietary solutions and people who are building up open source solutions and the like. And if people would comment on the interaction between these two things and the future of the movement. And secondly, in terms of the obstacles, in thinking about uh, a home-based environment, one can imagine lots of issues about intellectual property uh, and appropriation being raised uh, to, to kind of push back at the dispersion of uh, this technology, and I'd be interested in comments on that. Well, I think we have to find user-generated content in a whole new way, and that's one of the reasons I teed that up. I think it's going to be really, really important for us to understand that IP is going to play a significant role here, and if the video industry is any indicator, we're going to have to be really smart, but that's where companies like MakerBot, Arbitz from Bytes Organization, are trying to create communities and ecosystems where people will share their files all day long because they just want to do it, they just love sharing, and that's going to open up a lot more content available for printing, and so that's one of the reasons we invest in Arbitz from Bytes. So, so we're one of the proprietary companies on the high end as we make the massive investments to really drive new materials, new technologies, etc. But on the entry level, we have invested heavily in a, an open source concept. And we think you have to have a balance of both to really see this technology be widely adopted. And by the way, thank you for being a customer as well. But um, if you're building a machine that's going to do professional quality product and additive manufacturing, you typically tune your material and your process and your technology. All three of those have to match up to give you a perfect output. And that becomes incredibly important when you're doing something like certified aerospace and defense parts or when you're doing medical applications. So that's one of the reasons why the proprietary we think is critically important. And many of our systems, in fact most of them today, are proprietary where those three elements go together, the material, the process, and the technology. At the entry level, we don't think it's quite as critical because the, the typical approach has been more of this fused deposition modeling, we have dubbed it plastic jet printing, where you're able to, to use a fairly common set of materials, and we love PLA as well, um, for a lot of reasons, I didn't even notice that it smelled like waffles. I'll have to pay more attention next time. <laughs> I'm not sure we have any. But we do think it's really important to have both methodologies to really see the market explode. And there's absolutely no way we can do this by ourselves. I mean, we can drive something, a segment of it. We can make parts and kits more accessible to people. But, you know, a lot of people in the rep rap community, you know, have you ever seen a movie like Rain Man? You know, that's kind of like that's kind of like a whole bunch of these guys in the community, and you know, really good in certain areas, able to develop you know uh, really you know good technology, and you know, there's no way that we can do that. So you know, we we we, we push stuff forward, we make kits available, but we also you know take in what other people are doing, and so to make the process evolve and get better. So I mean, if it was all closed, 
and when you know it moves slow enough as is. I mean, this take it's one thing to ship a kid; it's one thing to ship a kid that works. You know, um, so this all evolves over time. And uh, if it was all closed, it would, it would just be really, really much more difficult to um, push it forward. If you've done your program, you should turn it to this page, which says it will be awesome if they don't screw it up. Uh, Michael, Michael is in uh, pu uh, public knowledge, which is throwing this thing, put this together, and it really addresses a lot of the stuff that we're, that's coming out around trademark, copyright, and patents. And um, it, you know, at Thingiverse, we had our first DMCA takedown this year. That was an adventure, and uh, it, it's gonna. It, it's it, we're at a we're at a time where, you know, with copyright, we've already sort of there's. I won't even go into I won't even go into a rant about copyright, but um, you know, sure. So a DMCA takedown is when somebody says, "Hey, that's my thing, and you copied it, and you can't share it." And we had there's something called a Penrose triangle, and a guy uploaded. Uh, he put it actually on your site. Yep. And this is a good, this ends good by the way. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he put it up there, and he said, "Here's this thing that's an impossible object. If you uh, and I'm not going to tell you how it works. You have to buy it." And um, so of course the community was just like, "Well, we can figure that out. That's a challenge <laughs> if we ever see one." And so within a few hours, it was. It was reverse engineered, redesigned, and tutorial was made so you could design your own. <laughs> so um, uh, then, unfortunately, what happened is it got boing boing, and the instructions of the things that got boing boing. Boing boing is a really popular website, and the guy, the original guy who designed it, was like, "Wait a second, that's not right." And so he issued a DMCA takedown on the uh, the, the the guy who designed it, did the tutorial. Um, you could get into all sorts of arguments of whether or not it was an appropriate DMCA takedown. But what, what was nice is that what ended up happening is the community was like, wait a second, is this really the way we want it to be? And uh, he came around and ended up uh, releasing his design into the public domain. So uh, kind of we're just at the beginning of this time where we're starting to figure that out. But this was, this was just an individual, meaning an individual um, basically uh, asking uh, Thingiverse to take a certain public down. But just imagine that, that all these makers are making things where other bigger companies don't really like what they're doing. Uh, like reverse engineering a car engine and, and, and making the parts of the car engine better. And then selling that. And then for some reason the car engine blows up. Who's at fault here? And which car engine did blow up? And which, which was the part which made it go wrong? And that makes it a really hard question about from, from not only from a copyright point of view, but also from a product liability point of view. We have a lot of users at, at Shapers who wants to create uh, toys, toys for children. And actually, uh, we don't allow that from in our terms and conditions. Not that because we don't want people to make toys, but there are so many rules associated with building toys and product liability that we don't. We want basically protect our customers from running into trouble there. And, and that makes it really hard. Where are the liabilities here? And who is at fault here? And who is, who is capable of protecting that? We at Shapers, we get like a thousand new products every day. It's impossible for us already, with, as a small company as we are, to check that. To check that if it's is it fitting a certain product, product liability thing, or is it maybe uh, a, a, an IP right violation in some uh, comment figure in India. I don't know. Um, that's really hard. And we're only at a thousand, and we're getting to a hundred thousand a day in, in a few years. And then it's really, really impossible. So how are we going to manage that? And how will companies like Shapeways, but also Thingiverse, uh, can stay in business? Because at the end, um, this can really uh, hamper us in, in our growth when we constantly are fighting other companies by, by with product takedowns and, and, and copyright issues or product liability issues. So for, for enabling creativity, we also need to create an environment for everybody to be creative. And it's basically set the rules, what is possible and what is not. Please be sure to stick for the second panel. We'll be talking more about uh, intellectual property and debt. Um, we, we're going to try to get into two more questions. So, uh, I don't know gentleman over here has been waiting. <coughs> oh, we have somebody. Oh. Thank you. Uh, Rob Halligan, not really affiliated with anything. Maybe the DC Fab Lab. Um, just interested. But um, this brings to mind, especially in the site. Is, is this something where the U.S. has a competitive advantage? Is, you know, we, if 
lot of manufacturing is gone overseas. Is, is, is the U.S. dominating here, and should we promote this to? Because we are turning into a third world country if we're not careful here. Thanks. I think it is a total opportunity for the U.S. Now, we are also a U.S.-based company, so 3D Systems was founded in North America. A lot of other companies are out of North America, but if we're talking about the additive manufacturing, being able to change the way we build products, being able to bring manufacturing back to our shores, either as a complement to, but not totally as a replacement for offshoring, I think it's something that we should focus on. It's really, really important. I'm not talking about having the technology and always wanting you to buy something from me. There are services that will provide these technologies to you, your output, your rapid manufactured product. And I think as a, an economy, we should embrace this. We should try to pull it forward and take better advantage of it. And I think uh, public knowledge is certainly one of the, the groups that's going to help us do that by bringing the heat and light to the additive manufacturing portion of today, not just the I want to be a maker and make things at home, because there's there's two sides of this equation, and I think we want to see both of them flourish and help us be more and more successful. Let me let me address that from a slightly different angle, and that is, you know, when I started, I made a lot of these parts myself. <coughs> you know, I used my equipment, my lathe, and my laser cutter and stuff to make these parts, and then you know, my consumers, my customers bought these and used them. And as the volume grew, you know, we moved having this stuff manufactured. So now we make stuff in-house. We also have a range of local manufacturers making parts for us. So maybe it's, whether that's whether it's a competitive advantage, you know, uh, if you have this technology in-house, if you're a capable individual, so let me rephrase this. If, um, as, as this stuff matures and gets more usable and there are more desktops, it's going to become less and less about access to capital and more of work about what you know. So if you know how to make stuff, you know, you can do stuff on your desktop. You can make short-run productions. And if, that's, if that gets adopted, if it makes sense, then you can scale this stuff up and have you know, commercial manufacturers run this stuff for you. So there's a slightly different angle to that. And, and, and individual, individuals can be little micro companies, and a lot of them. So you might not have, you know, you know, so you've got a lot of people that can, that can be productive this way. So we love it when people build businesses on our business. And we also just are so proud to be like, you know, we, you know, MakerBot, you know, Brooklyn, USA. So, you know, nobody's going to stop us from doing what we're doing, whether we get support or not. Um, we're just going to keep going until you all have access to 3D printing. But it would sure be nice if, if, if as awareness grows, if there, was, if there was support for this industry because it's just so empowering. It allows people to be, who wouldn't have the opportunity to be innovative otherwise, to be very innovative and very creative and build businesses. So it's going to happen whether we get cooperation or not, but cooperation gets to make it move forward faster. I think that one of the last uh, unique things uh, about the US is the spirit of innovation uh, and uh, the relatively low cost of uh, favor uh, and uh, of trying. Um, this is something that uh, Bruce Kim Kramer from NSF uh, said recently, and I think putting uh, innovation tools in the hands of the masses, so to speak, is the way that, to amplify uh, the strength, uh, and that's uh, that's one of the reasons why we should keep, uh, you know, we should having this technology widespread will really uh, amplify our uh, our ability to innovate. And that's what we should strive to do. Yeah, um, I'm Phil Corwin. I'm an uh, attorney and lobbyist here in town. And, and I got to, Bray, you really remind me of a lot of people. I heard of digital music conferences in the late 90s, which is not to say there's anything wrong with the enthusiasm of the vision, but, but I think perhaps I'll, I'll wait for the IP panel to, to get back into that. We've seen tremendous disruption of digital media and the internet to uh, the entertainment industry, the traditional media industry, all of that. Uh, we didn't see what's coming. Their whole business models were kind of kneecapped by what came along. If your vision is right, if 10 years from now we say, I don't have to go online to Amazon or go to the mall uh, to get this whatever, I can just create the software, download the software from a central website or buy a design for picnic 
lawyer or whatever for 99 cents and print it at home. That means nobody's going to the mall. That means there's grass growing up in the mall parking lot. People aren't working there. Sales taxes aren't being collected. That's very disruptive. I think it's even more disruptive than we've already seen from the internet. How disruptive will this technology be? And are there disruptions I haven't thought of yet besides the potential impact on the retail sector? If we never have to go to a mall again, who are the real winners there? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah things are changing. And, you know, just like you say in the 90s when the music industry changed, the ones that paid attention, you know, you know, I, I buy, you know, iTunes, that kind of thing, they're doing great. The ones that aren't paying attention, it, things do change. It's just a, and things in the USA change fast, can change really fast. So, I would say if, if you're, if you're, if like, we're in an interesting time, I think you're right to kind of pull in kind of issues with, that are similar to the music industry, and I think, for people in manufacturing and people who are innovative, now's the time to pay attention. You know, back in the 90s when the, this thing called the web showed up, you know, people were talking about it's going to replace the mall, and that absolutely did not happen. I mean, the web has delivered, you know, 150%, but it's because it brought people together. I mean, I can run an international company from my desktop now. I can have a supply chain that goes to China. I can hire programmers in Europe. You know, I can do all this stuff from the comfort of my home because of the internet. So, you know, what actually comes of this? And what we're talking about today may be completely divergent. And what I think is the real value is, is that when you get this technology to the desktop, it enables people to be, you know, not, I guess the word might be manufacturers, they can be micro entities. They can you know, take a design, they can manufacture it themselves, and, you know, so that it just opens up opportunities for individuals and small organizations. I would like to thank you guys for your questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're running a little low on time, but I'd love to give the panelists just one final minute. If you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? I'd like to thank Michael and uh, you all at Public Knowledge for bringing this forum together because I think it's been invaluable to share information, to hear some of the concerns. There's always opportunity and peril with any major disruptive technology. I think you've, you've gotten the flavor for that today. I do believe it'll be balanced and it will all be good. I'm convinced. Right, Bray? <laughs> <laughs> I'd also like to say thank you. I mean, we obviously represent a lot of uh, different and divergent viewpoints about all these subjects, but uh, in the end, this is sort of a, a big snowball rolling downhill, and to pretend as if it doesn't exist is the worst mistake we can make. So. I think that, uh, you know, if you look back in, in computer revolution, all the, you know, Intel, Microsoft, uh, Google, Facebook, all the, you know, the, the big uh, revolutionary companies uh, were in the U.S. And I don't know what it is that made uh, these companies start here and grow, but I'm pretty sure this is the next big revolution on that scale, and we have to do what it takes to make sure it, it, it happens here. Um, I feel like we just started the conversation. And so uh, it's so good to be here with these folks. And uh, I think you should also just make a point that uh, I said it before, but all of you are some of the most interesting people in the world right now as well. So I don't know exactly how we get to make sure we meet each other, but I think we should like make sure you go up to everybody here and connect if you can connect with as many people here because it's good. Thank you, public knowledge. Uh, I brought a sample kit with me that we'll have laid out so you can see how this stuff works. I also have a video. Uh, this was put together by a member of the community. It's a non-technical explanation of how all this stuff works. I'll have that set up and running as well. So please stop by and make it your table and you know, check it out. Thank you. Um, as, as Kathy already pointed out, this technology is already quite old. And when we were started to shape in 2007, we only started talking about 3D printing, 3D printing, and 3D printing. And we never actually talked about shape waves because really people didn't care. The 3D printing was much, much more interesting. And what's happening now, the last six months, is that it's really changing. People know what 3D printing is, people are actually using 3D printing, and it is changing the world. And um, I think this, this technology has huge opportunities, and, and, and the way we, we tackle this and, and enable this to, to grow will make have a major difference in the world. And to, to comment on this, uh, Google and all the other internet companies started in the US, there is a reason why Shapeways moved to New York uh, from, from the Netherlands. And that's because we think that in this country there is a lot of people who are open for innovation, there are a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of designers here. So it makes sense to, for a company like Shapeways to be here. 
And uh, I would like to add that, and I think there are definitely opportunities for the United States to, uh, to invest in this and, and, and make this an important part of the, of the, of the next generation. I'd like to thank the panelists one more time.